Bring in show music, please. Hi, I'm CNBC producer Katie Kramer. Today on Squawk Pod. Price pain. White House economic advisor Jared Bernstein says the administration is working to bring them down. We're trying to cut spending and we're being quite successful, particularly in the area of health care. And to keep policy at the heart of economics. Allowing Medicare to bargain for lower prescription drug costs, that actually saves consumers and helps the budget. New York's governor signs a first-in-the-nation bill to regulate social media and head off a mental health crisis. Kathy Hochul joins us. Leave the kids alone. Don't bombard them with algorithms that are irresistible to teenagers. Plus, the soaring drug stock after an FDA thumbs up, the hacks slowing down car dealerships, and would you pay to talk to a better version of your Alexa? It looks like Gigo to me. Garbage in, garbage out. It's Friday, June 21st. Days are getting shorter. Stop. Squawk Pod begins right now. Stand Becky by in three, two, one. Cue it, please. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. We're live from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. I'm Becky Quick. This is Joe Kernan. Andrew is off today. It's a Friday. We are almost there. Yes, the days may be getting shorter, but they're also getting warmer. We're going to have those lazy, hazy days of summer coming up. It's okay. I can live with the shorter days for now. Winter's right around the bend. Winter is. Every year you do this because you know you get to. Like Friday? is already almost Monday, and June is already... Ah, don't drag me down that way. See I'm gonna enjoy you the summer in when... September. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy the summer while we have it. People are booing in my ear. I'm... Frequently. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, this is, uh, look. No, I just want to, I just want to try and We're hold on to it. seize the moment. Yes. I just want to seize the moment exactly. and, and, and just and make sure we realize, you know, that life really is pretty short. Yes. Be happy with where we have and where we yes. are. Sarepta uh, Therapeutics uh, soaring. The company's gene therapy received expanded approval uh, in the U.S. up 33 percent to include more children with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's a deadly muscle disease. It expands the market. Uh, this does for Sarepta's controversial treatment that still hasn't provided benefit in clinical trials. The treatment is priced at $3.2 million. You just, I guess, Fortunately, you only need it once, but it, it was cleared under an accelerated approval pathway in October. Sarepta said that a trial failed uh, to clearly slow the disease, but secondary measures of patients' movements were positive, and the company filed for expanded full approval. I can remember talking about this five years ago and just looking at, where's David? We've got a, a, a big time geneticist in here who I happen to uh, go to, to, uh, to, to grad school with. We haven't seen each other in 45 years, uh, but um, you're not going to come on. I don't think you. Yeah. We, I, we actually were talking about this. I, I know. This is what we but care about. But there, there are intron, there are introns and exons, right, David? And and, and I and I think part of it, it there's there's just a one base pair problem where the ribosome falls off the uh, the DNA so that the the gene product is 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 not as long as it should be so it doesn't work for people with this is a gene therapy the reason it's so expensive it's a gene therapy it's a uh, the first time that they're watching approvals of something like this um Duchesne's actually affects boys more than girls it's terrible yeah it's be, muscular you could be a carrier as girl, jerry's but, kids some of them right uh, some of them i think jerry was looking more broad broadly this is a pretty rare aspect right. of muscular dystrophy but it's a proof but of function these kids die these kids die in Young. their 20s yeah. maybe they live to their 30s now um and and yes the hope is that they've extended it. They used to die at about the age of 16. So they've extended the life over the last several years. This is a one and done situation where it hasn't proven that they can be more flexible, which was the main endpoint. But they do see other signs that are much more promising. And if you can extend life already at this point, a lot of these kids are going to college. Right. Some of them have gotten married. Well, the, the proof of function, I mean, it doesn't at this point, even the drug itself isn't designed to make the entire gene, the entire gene product, just Correct. enough for it to be to replace Functional. What's and, and eventually you could design something that might allow the, you know, the, 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 to, to, to make the entire. That's gene uh, editing, gene. CRISPR. This is right. you know, a, little, a, little, a little different of, of just making sure it's out there. It's a one and done drug. It's the reason it's so expensive. It is the second most expensive drug on the market right now. 3.2 million for one time. The reason this is being watched so closely is because it's 
a hope for other rare genetic diseases, and there are so many of them. If, if a company can figure out how to make a platform for this, they could go after lots of rare diseases. Um, I have a daughter with a rare genetic disease, so we've been watching right. this very closely, too. Auto retailers across the United States and Canada could be facing days of software outages following back-to-back -back cyber attacks this week on CDK Global. The software provider has more than 15,000 dealership customers in North America, according to Automotive News. Dealerships across the country reverted to using pen and paper to process repairs and vehicle sales this week. After systems were initially restored on Wednesday, the company said that it suffered an additional, additional cyber incident and proactively shut down most of its systems once again. Axios is reporting that CDK told customers last night that it did not have an estimated time frame for resolution and that the dealer's systems would likely not be available for several days. But Joe, first of all, it hits at a really bad time. Um, over the holidays is when they have a lot of auto sales, sales and hope that they can get a lot of customers that are coming in. So mm -hmm. Juneteenth was a, a day that they were targeting. And I think it also looks at how these cyber attackers are looking for weaknesses that can affect entire industries, things we don't think about. I, I didn't realize there was a software company that dealt for most of the auto dealers, just like I didn't realize that uh, the the healthcare provider, remember that was that everybody across the, the all of these multiple oh, hospitals. United was Health, United was that Health. a... In it was they were using the same UNH, software yeah. for yeah it was united it was united health well, subsidiary subsidiaries yeah. for using software across all these hospitals and hospitals couldn't even process anything or check your insurance to see your availability if you were able to get some of these procedures we are really dependent on a lot of of things that may not always be as, as stable as yeah, we yeah. think yeah. The, the security yeah. of them are there times where your GPS goes down? I just have to stop. <laughs> I, I can't. Well, in this, in this town, it's okay. It's pretty grid-like. It's when you're out and about in other it's locations. A, it, the, the panic can, and, and it's just taking a little while, and the thing's going like this, and you're like, do I turn? Where am I? Am I missing an exit? Last month, CNBC reported that Amazon was working on a major overhaul to Alexa, its voice assistant. Uh, to incorporate AI, a Reuters report uh, just out this morning says Amazon is planning to include some conversational generative artificial intelligence. Uh, two tiers of service is what it's considering, and a monthly fee of around $5 to access a superior version could charge uh, as much as $10. Amazon has reportedly dubbed the new uh, voice assistant uh, Remarkable Alexa. Remarkable. Uh, remarkable Alexa. I, I was playing around with, with, I don't know, I was not impressed again yesterday. I was asking some, some questions about certain. With Alexa or Siri? No, just, just like AI. Oh, just I won't AI, say which yeah. one. And, and just asking questions. Is this true? Has this been proven? Is this, all it does is, is search around, it finds stuff, and then presents it as fact. And it, there's no analysis, there's no, uh, there's no thinking that goes, it just look, again, to me it, it looks, looks like, like a web crawler that we had back in the Yeah, it looks like ego to me. Garbage in, garbage out. The, the answers I was getting were, were I don't know. Although I, you I, could have scary aspects of AI where you can do these deep fakes and fool people into thinking things that are I still real. think that it has the ability, for example, if it was two years ago and you were to ask about the Wuhan lab, is it possible that, co that COVID came from the lab? Two years ago, when we weren't allowed to even broach that subject. Got a different answer than you get today. You would have gotten no. It's yeah. been disproven that you would have gotten the same crap laptop, same crap. No, it looks like Russian disinformation. You got the same crap from AI that you got from mainstream media at the I'm time. I'm not going to argue with you. I agree it's with the you. same, yeah. and, and it's it's run by the same people that, that kept that information from us a couple of well, years it, ago. It, uh, web crawlers were out there. These were things that existed back in the 1990s before you even got to 2000, where they'd go crawl the web for the best information they could find. This sounds like it's right. very similar. Right, or Reddit. goes on Reddit and finds some psycho. Next on Squawk Pod, the tax versus spend debate is red hot this election year. Jared Bernstein, chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, says the politics just might be driving the policies. Republicans have consistently cut funding to the IRS. This is a shadow tax cut for tax evaders, and it's a way to lose hundreds of billions by allowing millionaires and billionaires to evade taxes. This is Squawk Pod. 
Papa and Becky, Q. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Squawk Box. We are live at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. Inflation remains a top concern among voters, uh, but according to the White House Council of Economic Advisors, consumers are starting to see some release at, uh, relief at the grocery store. Joining us now uh, is the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, Jared Bernstein. Hey, Jared, how are you? Hey, man. Good to, good to see you. Good to see you. The, uh, the relief is coming from prices not rising as quickly, but, but the, the big price rises uh, are already in for a lot of things. I saw uh, a, a list the other day of, of things and, and just how much more that they do cost. So people still feel it um, if, if, you, you know, if you're mid to lower and even higher mm -hmm. income people. You do, know, mm -hmm. you do notice eggs or you do notice meats and certain things that are, that are more than they were. Obviously, it's progress that, um, that, that the prices aren't rising as much. I don't know if they ever go down. To previous levels, though, do you? Well, so first of all, let's start by uh, agreeing firmly on the point you just made. Look, prices are too high, and too many families are being squeezed by the cost of living. This is something the president talks about every time he leans into that, and that's why uh, we're taking aggressive action to lower costs. And I'll I'll talk about that in a second. We just released a new website at WhiteHouse.gov to go through all the areas in which we're trying to do that. Uh, and we're having some success uh, in ways I'll explain in a moment. But there are some groceries that have come down. So if you look at the piece that you're talking about, which we posted on the CE, uh, CEA blog yesterday, uh, there's about, I think, about 15 items that we found where prices are actually coming down. So it's not just disinflation, which is you know really very significant in groceries. They were growing about 1% before the pandemic. They got up to double digits. They're back down to around 1% in terms of grocery inflation. But again, we've seen some deflation, some lower prices in that sector as well. Jared, we, we, uh, yeah, any progress there is good, but on, on the bigger... On the bigger issue, and, and, um, and I don't know whether you would, would concede that, that maybe spending can hurt inflation. It was a, obviously it was a um, you know, post-pandemic and supply chain, and I know um, the president likes to blame it on corporate greed, things like that. I, 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 would, I, I don't know how that makes sense, because you know, corporations for 40 years uh, would have been raising prices if they could just willy-nilly. Well, right, right. But, but you know what I mean. The 40-year highs, it's more than just uh, price gouging. But my, my question is about this, what, what we're spending, the deficit, which that was not a good number yesterday, Jared. I think you know that, up so, to two, nearly $2 trillion. 7% yeah. of GDP. That's way too much. Why are we spending so much in, in a growing economy? Why is the deficit... So, of seven percent it's never been run when, when the economy's in a boom period like that so let's unpack a lot of what you just said because you started out with inflation and prices and that's uh, uh, a key part of our focus right now because again too many families are struggling with prices that are still too high so we have to aggressively attack that and i'll speak about that in a minute and i'll get to the fiscal point very important so <laughs> first of all it's a mistake to look only at the inflation side of the ledger. Now, look, we, as you see, we look very carefully at that side of the ledger, and we've talked about prices, we've talked about lower inflation. You also have to look at wages and income. So wages are beating prices. Uh, for middle-wage workers, wages <clears throat> have been beating prices uh, for uh, uh, about 15 uh, months in a row. If you actually look at disposable income, after-tax income, it's up $3,700 since before the pandemic. So let's be careful not to look at just one side of the ledger. Let's look at both. The fact that real wages and incomes are rising means people have more buying power. At the same time, we're cutting insurance premiums by uh, $800 for nearly, uh, 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 I think, what is it, uh, 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 you know, millions of Americans uh, by, by, uh, by lowering, uh, I think about 15 or 16 million Americans by lowering the premium tax credit, capping prescription uh, drug costs at, at 2000 a year for 54 uh, million seniors and so on. Now, in terms of the fiscal outlook, this idea that somehow cutting taxes doesn't have any fiscal uh, impact. And I think you and I probably have disagreed on this, Joe, for a long time. Uh, it is not just some act of nature that when you cut taxes, you end up with less revenue. That's a failure of trickle down. And again, I know we've argued about this, and I doubt we're going to agree today. Uh, but I think the record is very strong on that. Now, when it comes to spending, yes, we're trying to cut spending and we're being quite successful, particularly in the area of health care. All the things I just ticked through, 
allowing Medicare to bargain for lower prescription drug costs, uh, that actually saves consumers and helps the budget. So that's a twofer. Are you saying, uh, Jared, that disposable income of inflation adjusted is above where it was before the president came in? Because I think it's still below, is it not? I'm talking about if you look pre-pandemic, so I went from December inflation 2019. Adjusted. Right, inflation uh, adjusted. December 2019 to now, inflation adjusted, disposable income up $3,700. We're about to release something that shows that number, so uh, you'll see that uh, in front of you pretty soon. The, the amount of revenue at 17.5% or 18%, whatever you want to get, that's been pretty consistent. Why, why do we keep adding to, and we had Elizabeth Warren on the other, she has no, not to, when I ask her, would you, would you commit any of the, the, if you did have unrealized gains, uh, a wealth tax, if you raise taxes on corporations, if you raise capital gains, would any of that be earmarked uh, you know, for, for deficit reduction or debt reduction? And that, that didn't even cross her mind. W willing to spend 24% uh, of, uh, of, you know, of, spent of the well, GDP about... year after year, but we never spent, we used to spend 19 and get 17 and a half. Now we're getting 17 and a half and spending 24. Why do we keep doing that? It, it's like so two, the two definition of insanity, knowing that it's wrong and we continue yeah. to do it. Well, you know, I actually agree with part of what you're saying there. When you're in a hole, stop digging. And that's why right. this president's budget reduces the deficit by $3 trillion over 10 years. So we have uh, a very detailed plan written down to do exactly that. Now, if you look at what the opposition wants to do, it looks to us like just the opposite. Dig that hole deeper by fully extending the tax cuts that expire at the end of next year. The president's talked about extending those for families below $400,000 because it's a pledge not to raise taxes on them, but allowing those tax cuts to expire uh, above $400,000 so that the wealthy and rich corporations pay their fair share. Now, that is deficit reducing, whereas a full extension uh, would obviously you know, go the other way. Now, look, the other thing we have to do, you gotta, you're right, we have to hit both sides of the equation. When you cap prescription drug costs at $2,000 a year, not only are you helping 54 million seniors and lots of other Medicare uh, beneficiaries, but you're saving uh, hundreds of billions on the budget. So that is a uh, a really effective way to both cut spending, help the budget, and uh, along with that, uh, uh, the president's fair tax agenda, which, by the way, there's another piece of that which kind of gets under my skin. Republicans have, consistent, <clears throat> Republicans have consistently cut funding to the IRS. This is a shadow tax cut for tax evaders, and it's a way to lose hundreds of billions by allowing millionaires and billionaires to evade taxes. It's not okay with this president. It shouldn't be okay with anyone uh, in, uh, who pays Jared, their Jared, I'm not going to argue with you about cutting funding to the IRS. We have seen Good. that when you increase funding, you do get back even more money in, the, you, in the income that comes in. However... The plans where you talk about cutting the deficit, I mean, Biden's plan intentionally goes after taxing unrealized gains. And there are a lot of things in that budget plan that are not going to get passed. My assumption is that is one of them. So let's really talk about reducing the debt, sure. how we get at that. And most people who come on even will admit that you've got to come after both sides of this. But to be able to do this, we are now looking at I the agree. ECB, which has said that the Eurozone nations this week, they're saying that they have to have immediate and permanent debt reductions, that it's imperative because of the aging population, because of increased spending that's going to have to happen on defense. Why are we in any different situation? Well, first of all, let me uh, um, lightly uh, and politely challenge one thing you said, which is about legislative success. I feel like we've had this conversation before, Becky, where you said there's no way you're going to legislate that. And then lo and behold, President Biden managed to uh, get some uh, really important wins over the legislative goal line. So I think it's probably wrong. And I, so, although it's commonly done to discount the, the president's ability uh, to okay, whether uh, you're able to do it, it does. It, it, it seems crazy. It, it doesn't seem like a plan that a makes sense is fair as the, you constantly say what's fair and what's not to be taxing things that have not been realized yet. I can understand being frustrated when somebody's using unrealized gains to borrow against and use as income. That can be changed. Look, I know you don't. I, we've argued gains. about this before. I, I know. I know you don't. You don't like the. Uh, the minimum tax on, on billionaires, but the fact no, that- No, I don't have a problem with the minimum tax on billionaires. I have a, a problem with taxing unrealized gains, Jared. Big difference. 
I have no well, problem okay, with an so alternative minimum not, tax on income. I'm, I mean, this uh, is income this is a good conversation. This is a good conversation for its own segment because you know, as you know, we don't view it that way. We view it as a as a prepayment tax on gains that are are, are, are realized in the future. But at any rate, that's just one. So you're of pulling many forward different, taxes that would just, go to pay the budget down the road. Right. So that's just one of many proposals. What about uh, the, the president proposes to take the corporate tax rate from 21 percent to 28 percent? That's 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 about half the way back to where it was before. And look, every point on the corporate tax rate raises about one hundred and fifty billion uh, over 10 years. So that's real deficit reduction. Our opposition wants to go the other way uh, to, to lower the corporate tax rate. So, look, we 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 can argue about the granularity. And I'm happy to do that of the different plans. But we're trying to stop digging. We're trying to build our way out of that hole through both spending cuts, particularly on the healthcare side, which also delivers real benefits to working people in the form of lower drug costs, lower health care coverage, lower costs on insulin. And at the same time, uh, uh, yes, what I would describe as a fair share. Look, when <clears throat> the very wealthy are paying an effective tax rate of less than 10 percent, yeah, I think that's unfair. When the millionaires and billionaires are abating legal taxation to the tunes of hundreds of billions per year, yeah, I think that's unfair. And I think we should close sure. that tax gap. And, Jared, and, I, and, I, I'd I, love to go. continue this conversation. They've been telling us for the last four or five minutes that we needed to wrap. I'm, I'm sorry. I really would love to continue this conversation. Looking at spending cuts, that is more than just saying we're not going to pay anymore. We, I, I'd love to dig into that. And maybe the next time you're on, we can. I mean, you know, allowing Medicare to bargain for lower prescription drug, oh, that's something presidents have been going after for decades. And again, my point to you earlier, this president got that over the goal line. He legislated that. Jared, I, I, again, I'd love to dig into this. We will. This is an Let's ongoing so. debate that we've been having for years. We appreciate your coming on and talking about it. Sure. Thank you. Cheese will be next. Coming up, a story we have been bringing you all week here on the podcast, the harmful effects of social media on young people. Now, New York's governor, Kathy Hochul, has signed the first bill in the nation regulating social algorithms. We are going to empower parents to be able to turn on the off switch. You can bombard people with algorithms, young people with algorithms, but parents should be empowered to have control over that, not the companies. And the Empire State's leader also hit the brakes on a planned congestion pricing plan in New York City, which may not be quite dead yet. $15 is not the right price. That does not mean it's gone forever, but let's just be reasonable. Squawk Pod will be right back. Welcome back to Squawk Pod. New York State will never give up on the safety of its children, and that is why we are all here today. Our phenomenal governor who said, I'm getting this done, I'm getting this done this year, Kathy Hochul. And no matter how you feel about yourself because of all these influences and even the bullying in schools and people say bad things about you, you have value as a human being. You're a New Yorker. That gives you something that nobody else in this country has. You have the strength to endure. So I'm so proud to sign these bills. Let's bring it on, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations to everyone for getting it over the finish line. We did it. We did it. We did it. Our hosts today are Joe Kernan and Becky Quick. Here's Becky. New York Governor Kathy Hochul signing two bills aimed at protecting children and teens online. One aims to make kids' social media feeds less addictive. The other will curb websites' collection of children's personal information. But some in the tech industry are claiming free speech violations. For more on this, we want to welcome Governor Hochul. And uh, Governor, welcome and, and thank, thank you, you for, for taking steps to actually try and cut back on some of these things. It's been something that Congress has been unable to do over almost two decades of going back and forth on this. Um, wh what do these laws do? Well, first of all, I'm a former member of Congress, and I'm not surprised that Congress is not able to handle this, although this is, should be their responsibility. There should be a national policy that says, we prioritize the mental health of our children. It's that simple. And all the statistics are pointing to a very dire outcome for our children right now. Over the last two decades, last decade in particular, suicide rates among teenagers have gone up 70%. Teenage depression, something that was not a factor when I was growing up for previous generations, it is real. So many young people have been taken into a dark space because 
The companies have designed these addictive algorithms to pull them in and hold them captive at a time when they should be out with socializing with other people, paying attention in classrooms. So, so I had not surprised there's opposition, but here's my message to the tech companies. Why don't you get out of the courtroom and come into my conference room? We can work this out together. I think it's much better for your branding to show that you are socially responsible, morally responsible, and care about the outcome and the mental health of our children and your children as well. A, a, a group representing the tech companies, NetChoice, is arguing that your law will violate the First Amendment. For, they're censoring free speech online. Um, is this, it sounds like they're gearing up for some, some fights in the courtroom. What, what do you know at this point? What do you say back to this argument? Well, litigation's a gross industry in the state of New York. Bring it on. I and mean, that's, we're not a, unaccustomed to this, but we will prevail because we're very careful in our drafting to make sure that freedom of speech is protected. But we're simply saying to these children, you have the right to socialize with your friends. You can join a club online. We're not preventing online activity or communication. We're simply saying to these companies, as part of your marketing tools, that you're trying to create a captive audience that'll you'll, you'll hold them hostage for the next new chapter of their lives. We, we're saying, leave the kids alone, right? Leave our children alone. Don't bombard them with algorithms, addictive algorithms that are irresistible to teenagers. Just let them have this space before they're 18 years old to be a little more carefree. Let them select what they want to see and not have you pre-select based on monitoring these young people's social engagement. I mean, think about all the data that's being collected from our kids, not just being used by social media companies to construct algorithms to pull them in, but also monetizing this. You're profiting off your children, my children's information that's online. I think there's a business model that can be still very successful for these companies. And New York City, New York State, we are a tech capital. I mean, more everyone looking for tech jobs last year, we're the number one destination in our nation. We're proud of that. This is not hostile to big tech. We're happy they're in New York. We're happy they're doing what they do, except in this one space that they should also understand, they as parents should understand, is not healthy for this generation of young people. And the effects are real. This is not hypothetical. This is not just me going around and talking to thousands of young people and hearing their voices and the young woman who said to me, you know, you've got to stop, you've got to save us from ourselves because we're not able to put this down. And you realize it's not their fault. That's exactly what these companies intend. They don't want you to put down the device. And so that's what we're up against, but we're, we're ready for any challenge. It is clear that it's, it's not, uh happenstance. I'm looking at a, the lead story in the journal today, Governor, and uh, Instagram knows exactly how it's working. And racy content to teenagers. Gee, I wonder if that'll work. So they, 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 they start with it and they, they watch reels and they start a little bit soft. You know what I mean? And if the person watches it to the very end, then more racy stuff is offered at the end of it. And then God knows what comes in, but they know exactly I, I mean, the algorithms are designed to appeal exactly to, to that motivation. You're going to end up with, with everybody addicted to, to porn, and they know full well that, that that's what they're doing. And, you know, teenagers, I, I mean, I understand it. That's why racy content is going to work. So it, it just seems like a daunting task where to draw these lines. And, and, uh, and then I don't know where parents come into this either. I mean, I, you know, you could say these companies are just satisfying the normal urges of maybe teenagers with some of the stuff that happens. Uh, I will tell you this, this is all about driving profits. And parents under our new legislation, the first in the nation that is taking this step to protect this generation, and I hope every other state follows, follow what we're doing here in the state of New York, because here's why. We are going to empower parents to be able to turn on the off switch. You can bombard people with algorithms, young people with algorithms, but parents should be empowered to have control over that, not the companies. So parents will be able to now say, no, you're not allowed to do this. We're also saying that parents should be able to have say whether or not you can send messages and notifications between midnight and 6 a.m. Our children are sleep deprived. I mean, they're walking around like zombies in schools. They're not paying attention. And I also wanna say this to the tech companies. What you're doing is happening to your next generation of workers. If you're a business leader, 
looking at kids in middle school and high school as your future workforce, and you realize that they're so addictive that even during the day they can't put down the smartphone, they're not paying attention to their ge geometry class, their teachers. And they're also not developing social interpersonal skills that are so necessary. I mean, it's the creative collisions that happen in the workspace that drive the innovation economy, which we're so proud of in New York. We wanna foster that. But let's protect the mental health, not have a workforce that is coming out of teenage years in a state of depression and yeah. unable to communicate at a healthy level with other adults because they were denied this because of what your companies are doing. So just stop right now. You can make plenty of other money in other ways. I guarantee it. Very creative Governor, people work in these companies, but let's save our children. We, we have had other people say that this could be something where if other states do copy, you would eventually be pushing federal regulators to, to get involved with this, federal, federal legislators to get involved with this too. So hopefully this at least brings some attention to this and does force others to follow along. While you're here, I want to talk to you about congestion pricing. Um, this is a move that had been anticipated to take place later this month in New York City. Already, uh, the um, infrastructure has been set up for it. You put a, a halt on this for now because you say it's not the, not the right time when you're trying to get workers back into offices, when you are trying to make sure that people will come back uh, from work from home. How long does this this shut down last? Is, is this something that you see coming back next year? Here's what we're thinking right now, and I'll tell you why this is so important. We cannot be tone deaf to the needs of our workers or our employers. I have talked to so many employers, major employers in New York City, who are concerned right now that things are improving, we're working, on, our comeback is almost there, but we don't need a setback at this time. And with remote work, which not even exists back when this was enacted under my predecessor back in 2019, people might say, well, do I really want to spend $3,800 more a year to come into Manhattan, or will I just see if I can work remotely? That could have a dire effect on our comeback and our economy and all the subsidiary businesses that count on, I mean, Broadway, restaurants, uh, little delicatessens, the shoe shine person. All of these are affected by whether or not people come into our city. I want people to come into our city. That's important to me. I want us to continue thriving and, and putting the, the pandemic in the rearview mirror. But right now, $15 for anyone to drive into New York City is too much at this time. So I'm working with our legislators to find an alternative funding source because every single project that is envisioned with the money generated from congestion projects is an important project. I support them. I have supported congestion pricing, but think about the effect of $15 right now. Even you're, London- you're, that you're, preaching, you're preaching to the choir. I, I agree with you on all of these counts. I think it's a bad idea from the broader economic perspective here. And I've heard from a lot of those businesses too. Um, the issue is some people say that this was political, that there were going to be democratic uh, legislators who lost in this election coming up in November, and there is this undercurrent that thinks, okay, this is gone for now, but by early next year, it will come back. What do you say to that? I will say right now, $15 is not the right price. That does not mean it's gone forever, but let's just be reasonable. Right now, New York City residents are under siege. They have high cost of living everywhere they turn. Water rates just went up, rent rates are going up. It is a lot for our citizens. And we should not ignore them saying to us as government leaders, we just want a break once in a while. Who's listening to us? Mm -hmm. I'm listening to them. That's and good. And, and by know, the way, if you're looking for alternative revenue sources, this was going to raise about a billion dollars a year. $700 million is being lost right now every year from people who are jumping the fares at the subways and the buses. 45% of bus riders aren't paying their way. There's $700 million you could go after. You're absolutely right. I've said that before. So there's other funding sources. I want to do the Second Avenue subway. I want all the improvements that have been promised to New Yorkers based on the bonding off this $1 billion. But we are capable of doing this. I support the MTA. I bailed out the MTA last year. No one can question my commitment to this lifeline that makes New York City so fabulous and so accessible. We love the subway system. I am a, mm -hmm. the biggest supporter of the New York City subway system because last year it was going off the fiscal cliff and I pulled it back with a creative funding strategy. I'm committed to this. I'm committed to the projects. 
But right now, at this time, it is too much for New Yorkers to endure this. I don't want to suppress our recovery. And that's the, the genesis of the pause. Uh, again, temporary pause. But I'm going to say this again. $15 is too much for New Yorkers right now. We, and, and people love it when, when you say, well, we already spent the billion. We need to do it. It's like, what the that, that's what drives people crazy. It, it's already spent, right? The billion's already spent, so we need it. We're in the How middle of a $34 billion <laughs> capital project right now. $34 billion is being spent right now. This would I leverage know. $15 billion more for projects that are important, but there's a lot of activity going on in New York City. We're committed to our subway system, but we're also committed to everyday New Yorkers who are struggling. Subway hoppers. I did. Yeah. Governor Hochul, yeah. thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. That's Squawk Pod for today and for the week. Thanks for tuning in. Squawk Box is hosted by Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Tune in weekday mornings on CNBC at 6 Eastern and follow Squawk Pod wherever you listen. Get the best of our show every day. We'll meet you right back here on Monday. Have a great weekend. We are clear. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.